Hey, you want to know something cool? The Eiffel Tower is built so uh, efficiently, and there's so much empty space in the Eiffel Tower that if you were to take the base of the Eiffel Tower and then draw out a circle around it and imagine a cylinder going all the way up around the Eiffel Tower just with you know a radius half of that base length, the air in that cylinder would weigh more than the Eiffel Tower inside of it. So the Eiffel Tower is so efficient, ha ha, that the air around it weighs more than the structure inside of that imaginary cylinder. Baguette? Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the show where I take your comments, questions, and corrections about all the nerdy stuff we get up to on this channel and then tell you where we're going next. Hint, where we're going next in the next episode can be summed up in a single word. Boy. So in the last episode of Because Science, I was trying to give you the very best science-based advice for what to do if you were in a real, live Tyrannosaurus Rex encounter. I said that if you have a place to hide, you should hide. If you must run, find an obstacle-laden path to try to lose her in. If you can shoot her, shoot her. Otherwise, go for the legs. Sweep the leg! There is no fear in this dino! Is there a problem? Sweep the leg. Is that the line? I forget what... I feel like that's what he says. But what did you have to say? Expelliarmus. Our first comment comes from Michael Berthlesen, who says, what tensile strength would you need your tripwire to have in order for it not to snap when being exposed to a sprinting Tyrannosaurus Rex hitting it leg first? Well, in the episode, I said that you would want to sweep the leg because if the Tyrannosaurus were to topple over, because it's eight tons and it has a moment arm, basically it's legs that it could topple over that's many meters high, the fall from such a height might actually kill the animal, as research I could find suggests. So, trip it. But what strength of tripwire would you need? Well, I think just pretty much steel cable would do it of any decent strength. As another commenter points out, John A, it wouldn't really have to be strong as much as it would have to just cause an initial trippage. It's a real word. Because once the Tyrannosaurus Rex loses balance, it increases the risk of a fall right there. And you might be able to get away from it and it might start to topple over. So you don't need something that can withstand the full force of a Tyrannosaurus Rex stride. You just kind of need to trip it up. And even if you do, you might lose Dak. He felt like he could take on the whole empire himself. Or was that a different character? I don't care. Our next comment comes from David Herman who says, let's see if I can get on the follow-up episode. Ah, I'd argue that we didn't win the fight because we weren't in the fight to begin with. Clever. He goes on to say, the dino lost a fight to an asteroid and we were born out of the stardust from that impact and probably dino poop. Now, I don't know about the dino poop thing, but because nothing really leaves our planet aside from, you know, uh, metal buckets of science, which I call rockets, and some atmosphere sometime, pretty much everything that's on the planet gets recycled inside of the planet, like all of the air and all of the molecules that are in the water. Simply because in water there are so many molecules that make it up, in this mug, the amount of water in this mug right now is more than six trillion trillion molecules. So just because there's so many, the chances are very high that if you are drinking water or breathing air, there is at least a molecule of that air or that water that has passed through the system of a dinosaur. So you are breathing the very same air that dinosaurs did and drinking the very same water. It also means um, some of your water is also dinosaur pee. But that also applies to everything, right? You're also breathing the same air that Einstein did. You're also drinking the same water that other less good people have. So it applies to everything, but it's still cool. We are all connected atomically and through the recycling system of the Earth. We're never truly fully removed from dinosaurs in their lives because what they dealt with, we still, we, we still deal with in our lives. And if you, and we still have birds and da na na. Our next comment comes from the Horned King, king of all horns, especially the sharp ones, who says, do you think you could distract 
the Tyrannosaurus Rex with something like a flare, as you've seen in the Jurassic Park films, or some other kind of light, would that be effective? You know, I have no idea. Behavior, especially dinosaur behavior, is really hard to coax out of fossils. You have to look for other things that may indicate how these animals actually live. So I cannot say if a Tyrannosaurus Rex would really be distracted by something like a flare or something like a laser pointer with a really, uh, with a, with a really bright dot and it would be distracted like a kitty. They had excellent eyesight and if we think about birds, they don't really get distracted by bright lights in the same way, at least as far as I can tell, except when they fly into, into those solar collector panels and burst into flame. I don't know, it's really hard to tell. I don't think we have the research to say so. But it can still see you. It's not like if you don't move, it will see the flare move and go for that. It can see you just fine. What is it? What is that? What is that? I am distracted. Oh, okay. Wow, that's effective. Our next comment comes from Sergey HDZ, or Hids, who says, but who wins a race, T-Rex or Velociraptor? Well, I said that the research I could find puts the T-Rex's running or fast walking speed at around 11 miles per hour. That is not nearly the fastest dinosaur, at least as far as we can tell from how we think dinosaurs moved and how they walked or ran. The running speed of the Velociraptor is estimated from what I could find at 40 miles per hour, almost 64 kilometers per hour. So it could easily outrun a T-Rex in a race and it could easily outrun you. And Sergey, Velociraptor, Velocity Raptor, it's right there in the name. I said good day. All there, clear as crystal. You, you said Velociraptor race. And I had to do this show, which was commented and annotated, so you get mentioned. Thank you very much. Can't get sued, not the same words. Our next comment comes from Horrier, a frequent commenter, who says, what if you were to run over to the T-Rex's foot, wrap your arms and legs around it, and hang on for dear life? I doubt an animal as top-heavy as T-Rex could be able to shake you off, and its neck isn't going to reach its ankle. You could literally keep that up until the T-Rex exhausts itself, just like humans do when facing stronger or faster prey. Now, uh, I don't know why the T-Rex wouldn't be able to move its head down to its feet when it presumably started eating its prey. Once it was dead, the prey would be on the ground. It could bend its head to get down towards its legs, but <laughs> I just like your idea, Horrier, because it is so childish and pure. What if instead of, of trying to kill the beast, we just run and hug it until it stops? No? Okay. Sir, sir, have you tried hugging it? Oh my God, I'm gonna hug its leg. I want you to all stay perfectly still. Its vision is based on whether or not it's being hugged by you. <laughs> this is some guy in the background. What if you hugged it? Our next comment comes from Zach Chast, who says, what would a T-Rex sound like though? Would it roar, would it growl? What sounds would it make while existing? Oddly specific. As far as scientists know, T-Rex probably didn't roar, at least not like it does in the movie. If we look to birds, they make chirps, and if we look to reptiles like alligators and crocodiles, they make more guttural, vibrate kind of sounds, like So not really like that classic roar. However, the roar in the movie is based off of real animal sounds, and it, it is a pastiche. According to the book, Making of Jurassic Park and Adventure 65 Million Years in the Making, the T-Rex roar from the film was actually a combination of a baby elephant squeal, an alligator's gurgling, <laughs> and a tiger's snarl, and its breath was the sound of a whale and its blowhole. So what would a T-Rex sound like? Well, it probably wouldn't roar like it does in the Jurassic Park franchise. Uh, it might gurgle or, or, or emit kind of a, a very low rumbling like alligators and crocodiles do. <laughs> Not like that though. Again, from, from fossil evidence, it's very hard to tell things like the internal workings of structures when we only have bones. I mean, we, we can see cavities in the T-Rex and other dinosaur skulls that may kind of get at maybe what sounds that they could make, but it's still very hard 
to tell just from fossils. So it's an open question. Become a paleontologist and figure it out. But the best comment at the time of this filming, I gotta give to Science with Steph, who says, thinking about the force a T-Rex makes with stomping around, if every step does indeed exert 117 kilonewtons of force, then this would propagate radially out through the ground following an inverse square law, roughly assuming surface propagation from the epicenter, this means that at a distance of, say, 50 meters away from the dinosaur, the force will have reduced to 46 newtons. Not enough to do any real damage, but more than enough to rattle a glass of water, I, I, I got it, to show ripples. Science with Steph calculated that an animal that size, that far away, would probably still ripple a glass of water just like you see in the movie. And I appreciate that math and that confirmation. So Science with Steph, you are a super nerd. Ah! My boy! I don't know. My boy's always in trouble. Hey, but I'm not always correct. Look at how I'm sitting. I'm very defensive about that. So what did I get wrong in last week's episode? According to you, faceless, nameless, nerd. Our first correction comes from a lot of people who all say that when I made a jab at wearing high heels while running away from a Tyrannosaurus Rex, I said that that was the director's choice and you all pointed out that that was actually Bryce Dallas Howard's decision to keep them on as a part of her character. Uh, fine. So I guess what I was getting at is that if you were actually to outrun a T-Rex through mud and on irregular surfaces and such, you probably would have a better option than high heels. Even if Miss Howard chose to wear them and the director said okay, Still, I think the internet's point and my point is that if you're running over a regular rough terrain with some mud away from a dinosaur that would, that would require you to sprint to get away from it, high heels probably not the best choice. I would have taken them off, but that's just me. And they're uncomfortable in my feet. How do I know that? I wear climbing shoes. My climbing shoes are a size eight. It's small. They crush your feet into it. So our next correction, I'm, I'm not really sure it is a correction, but I just want to read it and try to sound all cool while I, while I read it. Uh, our next correction comes from you can't, you can't Stop Me, who says, So couple of things, by blade or by gun, it will fall. So you've studied the blade? <laughs> Nothing personal, kid. By gun or by blade, it will fall. Hey, do you watch anime? <laughs> me too. <laughs> nice try, kid. Nothing personal. Ching! <laughs> Thought so. Where'd you see that move? Toonami? <laughs> Amateur. Our next correction comes from Robin Rometta and Ato Raja. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. Who say, uh, wouldn't the skin of a Tyrannosaurus Rex be too thick or too tough to get through with conventional weaponry like bullets like a gun or the blade. <laughs> Again, this is something that's really hard to say with just fossil evidence. In recent years, we have actually found fossilized dinosaur skin, which is amazing. It's millions and millions of years old, and though it's not really skin anymore, we still have the impressions and what it looks like and what the structures inside it were, and that is awesome. I cannot find any standardized thickness for Tyrannosaurus rex skin, but if we're equating it to a large animal like an African elephant, then its skin will be really thick, and if it's like crocodilian, skin, then it will be really tough, but still, given a sharp enough blade or a high enough caliber weapon, you're still probably going to make it through. What the Tyrannosaurus Rex didn't have, which some other dinosaurs did have, is that bony armor plating like Ankylosaurs had, so it would have less protection than you think, probably. I don't know, let's resurrect one and fight it. I mean, I've seen a katana cut through an entire pig. Not a live one. And I've seen a 50 cal go through an inch of steel at a mile away. So, I don't know if the Tyrannosaur is gonna be able to stand up to your gun or the blade. <laughs> nice try, nothing personal, dino. Oh, what's that? You have Mountain Dew too? Sick, the only thing left to do is finish you and then lick this Dorito dust off of my thumb and forefinger. <laughs> I've studied the blade many years, and what I can tell you is hiya. Our next correction comes from Retsaf1, who says, if the average person can sprint about 15 miles per hour in short spurts, couldn't you outrun a T-Rex, assuming that it would get tired? So you could sprint away from it and wait for the Tyrannosaurus Rex to get tired. 
Well, I said that the Tyrannosaurus Rex could chase you, whether walking fast or maybe even running at 11 miles per hour. But what I didn't say is some research even pushes that number up to 20 miles per hour, closest to the fastest recorded speed of any human, which was set by Usain Bolt. Given that a full dead sprint at 20 miles per hour isn't something that most humans could do and not for extended periods of time. I still stand by the fact that it would be hard to outrun a T-Rex in a straight line without finding that obstacle laden path. Like I said, you I think you'd have to be Olympic level sprinter to fully tire out a T-Rex. I think an easier option is just to zag and then zig zigzagging. <laughs> That's a nice trick. Couldn't fool me though. I can detect your power level for up to from off planet. Think you can escape my blade? <laughs> no. Our next correction comes from Mab and Red Dragon who says that in Jurassic Park 2, they flung a guy up. The T-Rexes did. They, they grabbed a guy and they flung them up in the air and then ripped him in half. And I said a T-Rex's neck muscles are estimated to be strong enough to fling 115 pounds or so, 15 feet in the air. And so the correction was, well, haven't you seen Jurassic Park 2? Isn't that good enough? No, it's not good enough. I wanna see a Tyrannosaurus Rex grab a teenager and fling them, <laughs> I'm assuming they're 115 pounds or so, and fling them two stories up into the air while they're texting and vaping and then eating them in one bite because they could eat 500 pounds in one bite. And the last thing that we'll ever receive for them is a text that says you up uh, and they didn't finish it because they have been chompy chomped. Not good enough. You hear me? Spiel. Chiva. I don't know. I don't know directors, but the best correction I got at the time I filmed this episode, I got to give to Josh Boucher who says it's a long one. But it's interesting. It says, so if you were smushed by the foot of the marker T-Rex with 117 kilonewtons and perfectly recovered and assuming you have a cross-sectional area of Chris Hemsworth, <laughs> that's being very generous, then the embodiment of the emotionless void that is, as you have said it, it has, it has a compressive strength of 255 PSI at the waist. Now from the numbers that I could find, that seems at least comparable to the average Earth human. To me, this begs the question, were you created by the emotionless void or were you an Earth human that somehow found a way to journey to the void and are possibly altered by it? And this isn't the only question to be answered here. Are you made out of emotions? Are you electrical energy? Are you a summation of thoughts from the universe? Okay. I know it looks like I'm standing on something when I'm in the emotionless void that I'm sometimes let out of to do other parts of this channel, um, but I'm not. I'm actually floating. And that's because, like you said, I'm not, I'm not really there. I'm more like created. I'm, I'm not energy like you're putting it, but I am, it, it, is, it is like, I, I haven't really figured it out yet, but it feels like to me the void is reaching out to you and creating me and the episodes um, by altering something in your brains that would hallucinate the explanations of me. Like I said, I haven't really figured it out, but the bottom line is, is that something very weird is going on. Maybe someday I'll figure it out. But you know what I got all the time in the world for in there? Studying the blade. <laughs> so you think you're quick, huh? I'll show you quick. <laughs> Nothing personal. Pizza roll. Perfect. Oh wait, so congratulations, Josh. You are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> Maybe that's how they would sound. I don't know. Something like that. I don't know. Maybe sound. Maybe sound like a real, like a like a dying lamb. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha at ProjectAlpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be because you have already seen it. You got the main episode on this channel two days earlier than everyone else and other premium content from Eek and Sundry and our partners. Hey, hey, lucky you. But if you haven't subscribed to Project Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is, how cold is Kratos' ex? Mm, boy. <clears throat> Ha! <laughs>
hard on the pipes. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I am sciencing the signature weapon from the fantastic new game, God of War 4. Kratos, the main character in that game, has a massive ax that when he throws it, Thor style, at an enemy, it is able to become super cold and freeze enemies fully on contact, but just how cold would that weapon have to be in order to do something like that? Hint, very, very cold. Cold. Very, very cold. Nope. Spoiler alert, it would be very, very chilly. Reverse your expectation. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet all about fighting T-Rex and leave me your comments, questions, and corrections so I can feature them on the next edition of Because Science Footnotes. And you can leave those all at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want another show with me in it, you can check out Natural Selection. It's a debate show where we debate science versus fiction. Me and my friend and very smart witty colleague, Daniel Casey, debate. We even debated uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex versus dragons, and it was a lot of fun, and you can see that here. Dragons serve as both protectors and destroyers of mankind, and they deserve our utmost reverence. Think about the cosmic miracle that is just knowing about dinosaurs. Kyle, I don't know what's more painful, listening to you or watching Jurassic Park 3. Dan, I think stupidity sometimes, in your case, uh, uh finds a way. Fun, right? If you subscribe to Alpha, you can watch it every week and vote, and we will also be streaming it on this channel every other week, so check it out. And don't forget, everyone that you've ever met is probably dealing with something that they're not telling you about, so be nice to them. And you're now in control of your own breathing. <laughs> gotcha! You thought I was just being nice! No! I'm manipulating you! Too far!